be kind of picking up where we've been going through the last while together. Uh, we're picking up in Hebrews 3, verse 14, will be where we, where we start. And you'll remember from our study of Hebrews that, you know, Hebrews is really focused on the superiority of Christ. Christ is better than the angels. You see that in chapter 1 and 2. And then in chapter 3, the author sets out to prove that Christ is superior even to Moses. The preacher of Hebrews does this throughout the whole book. He places all the attractive elements of religion, and he takes them and he contrasts them with the superiority of Jesus Christ. Last week, we started looking at Hebrews chapter 3. We found ourselves kind of in the middle of it. You probably remember verses 1 to 6. That's where he establishes the contrast between Moses and Christ. Just like we saw in chapter 1 and 2, that Christ was compared with angels, shown to be superior to them. So also in Hebrews 3, 1 to 6, Christ is shown to be superior to Moses, the faithful servant. The author highlights the fact that Moses was faithful, and he was a faithful servant in the Lord's house. He was honored as a faithful servant in the Lord's house. But you notice in verses 3 and 4, Jesus is deemed to be more worthy of honor. We point out that Moses was a faithful servant in the Lord's house, where Jesus is the son in the Lord's house. He was, in fact, the architect, the builder of the house itself. In view of the superiority of Jesus over Moses, the author tells us what we see constantly throughout the book to keep our constant focus, to have our lives pointed towards, to live in consistency with the profession we have in our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, thinking about the Moses and Christ comparison moved the author to ask some questions about the house that was under Moses compared to the house that was under Christ. He then moves into a lengthy explanation of this, which we began last time in verse 7 of chapter 3. And it actually runs all the way through chapter 4, verse 11. Again, this is a lengthy examination of the people under Moses who did not enter God's rest. And we saw that verse 11 of chapter 3 last time compared with the people of Christ. I mean, that, that's it. That's the comparison. And what is characteristic of all of those under Christ is that they enter the rest. No child of Christ misses the rest. So it is paramount that we examine ourselves. So no one is self-deceived by the deceitfulness of sin and unbelief, but that we strive to make sure that we are in the household of Christ. And that was verses 6 and 14 of chapter 3. And in a perfect situation, we would be able to go from chapter 3, verse 7, all the way through chapter 4, verse 11 in one shot. We wouldn't have to insert in a chapter break or anything like that. But today I want to turn our attention to the focus of the issue of entering God's rest. So let me read the end of chapter 3, verse 14 to 19, where we left off last time, because it sets the stage for what that rest is. Our text reads, For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. While it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as when they provoked me. For who provoked him when they had heard? Indeed, did not all those who came out of Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would never enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were not able to enter because of unbelief. In chapter three, on two occasions, the audience is called brothers. As much as he can humanly discern, these are people who profess faith in Christ. And you might wonder, why are we speaking so much about falling away? Why are there so many warning passages in the book of Hebrews? And I will tell you why. Because he understands that no one but God knows who are his children. Only he knows with infallible accuracy, him and him alone. There are those even among us today who attend church, Bible studies, have been baptized, or even members of our church, but are still without the light of God in their souls. In other words, they have not been regenerated. Consider Demas. He was a traveling companion to the Apostle Paul, and he must have been someone Paul regarded with some worthy, someone worthy of honor. He is mentioned at the end of the book of Colossians along with Luke. He is not some insignificant individual. Colossians 4.14 says, Luke, the beloved physician, sends you his greetings and also Demas. 
So Demas must be an important person to Paul. Paul wasn't the kind of guy who would commend just anyone. He had a lot more seriousness about him than that. Perhaps you remember Acts 15. There you will find Paul, John, Mark, and Barnabas were traveling on the harsh road doing the work of an evangelist. And you see, Paul had little patience for erratic flip-flop ministers. On one occasion, they were traveling and they ran into some hardship and John Mark shrinked back and abandoned Paul and Barnabas, left them to fend for themselves. So the next time that Paul is asked to take John Mark with him on a missionary journey is Acts 15, 37 to 40. And what you see there is this, Paul does not want to take him along. Paul sees him as a liability, a turncoat, a deserter. He does not have time to take someone along with him in ministry like that. Paul believed that John Mark wasn't up for the task and Barnabas being more sympathetic and encouraging by nature on account of Paul's unwillingness to take John Mark with them on the missionary journey, he actually parted ways with Paul. We see Paul didn't associate with people who he thought were half measures. He didn't want to associate himself in ministry in the hard work of ministry with half committed individuals. So back to Demas, if Paul is commending Demas in Colossians, traveling with him in ministry, right? As you see in Colossians four, then Paul must have thought that Demas was a committed man of God. And yet the very last letter that Paul wrote where he's sitting in a putrid Roman prison, just before his execution, he pleads with Timothy to come, to be an encouraging companion to him. You see, at the end of his life, Paul needed someone to encourage him as well, to help him finish the race strong, to help shoulder the burden to die well. And what does he say? Second Timothy 4.10, Demas, because he loved this wicked world has deserted me. Demas forsook Paul. He abandoned the ministry and he left town. Now we don't have time this morning to consider the shipwreck of the life of Demas but he paints a startling picture of what we see as the author's concern in Hebrews chapter three, verse seven through four eleven. And perhaps there is someone here this morning who is on the path of Demas. Perhaps you are at a similar crossroads as those early church believers to forsake Christ. You see, authentic Christians are never lost, but I promise you this counterfeit Christians are never saved. They never enter into God's rest. I mean, even Judas would be a good example of this. He would have come as a surprise to the apostles and the disciples of Jesus. His craftiness was so subtle that the only person on earth who was never deceived by him was the omniscient Jesus Christ. And you know what? I, I bet his hardness was so crafty. His deceitfulness and sin was so camouflaged that he even convinced himself. I promise you that. Second Timothy 2, 11 to 12 tells us this. For if we died with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. But if we deny him, he will also deny us. Counterfeits always fold under pressure. They apostatize. They turn their backs on grace. We know that, but we don't know who the elect are. And so, as we saw last time, one of the ways to examine ourselves to see if we are in the faith is through this personal edification of fellowship. And that's why we need one another to help us to see our own blind spots. Charles Spurgeon once said, the scripture does not teach that a man will reach his journey's end without continuing to travel along the road. It is not true that one act of faith is all and that nothing else is needed of daily faith, prayer, and watchfulness. Our doctrine is the very opposite, namely that the righteous shall lay hold on his way, or in other words, he shall continue in faith in repentance, in prayer, and under the influence of the grace of God. We have never thought that merely because a man supposed that he once entered on this way, he may therefore conclude that he is certain of salvation, even if he leave the way immediately. No, but we say that he who truly receives the Holy Spirit so that he believed in the Lord Jesus Christ shall not go back, but perseveres in the way of faith. Our text is concerned with revealing who the children of God are compared and opposed to who are the children of the devil. He knows that there are many who are tempted to turn back, to turn away from Christ, to fall short. And we saw last week, God's graciousness towards Israel, 
They had heard all there was to hear about God. They had seen all there was to see about God. And yet their hearts, they refused to believe in him. They were hardened. And this is why we have, we, they, they were barred from the promised land. So it is with many who are drawn to Christ. Unbelief forfeits rest. This is what the writer's thought is. So you see here, Hebrews 3, 14 and 19 is repeating what we spoke of last week in 7 through 13. He even recites, recites Psalm 95, 7 again. He's reiterating that there are many who miss out on the rest who trusted in Moses. He asks who fell away? Those who heard and rebelled. It was those who Moses led out of Egypt who saw miracle after miracle, sign after sign, wonder after wonder. After all they saw, after all they heard, they did not believe. It asks, who was God angry with? Those who sinned, whose bodies filled the desert. And God swore that they would never enter his rest. That's it. Rest. Unbelief ends in death and barring from entering God's rest. You see from the end of chapter three, who doesn't enter rest, right? Those who miss out on the rest of God. And then our attention shifts. How does a believer examine themselves in such a way that they gain more assurance that they are not self-deceived and that they do enter rest? How does a believer enter rest? That's verse one of chapter four through 11. Let me read that for you. Therefore, let us fear if, while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have come short of it. For indeed, we have had good news preached to us just as they also, but the word that they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. For we who have believed enter the rest, just as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works are finished from the foundation of the world. For he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day and God rested on the seventh day from all of his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter rest and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience, he again fixes a certain day today saying through David after so long ago, just as you heard it said before today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts for if Joshua had given them rest. He would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, let us be diligent to enter that rest so that no one will fall through following the same example of disobedience. If a person's spiritual condition can be measured by his personal exodus in the past, if the past is the only evidence that you have to point to, then the writer of Hebrews is saying that that is not sufficient. You must examine yourself to see if that is you, or you are liable to not be one who will enter into the reward of being a partaker with Christ. He says, don't fall short. Don't fall away. Don't come to the end of the race and quit. We want to help you enter into the Lord's rest to examine yourself so that you aren't barred from the heavenly reward so that you can enter into God's rest. He says it repeatedly over and over and over again from Hebrews three to four. We see the land not entering into the rest that the promised land signifies. It is a type of the anti-type of the full ultimate experience of eternal rest. Now, this is not to say that all the land promises are merely type with no physical realities. I'm not saying that, but what I am saying is that the land is a type and the anti-type is eternal rest. That is what our author is saying here. He's drawing a comparison with what the re with what the rest signified. Israel was finding rest from the wandering of their enemies here on earth, but only it foreshadowed the eternal rest. The foretaste with Christians this side of heaven have come to experience in their hearts. So in our text, we'll see that there are four principles for rest that you need to pay attention to this morning if you don't want to fall short of God's promise. First, 
rest requires faith. That's verses one and two. Second, rest belongs to God, verses three to six. Third, its promise is still valid, verses seven to eight. And finally, it demands our rigorous consideration, verse 11. So again, it requires faith, belongs to God, it's still valid, and it demands consideration. So first, the ultimate rest requires faith, verses one and two. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is, what is rest? The basic idea is that of ceasing from work or from any kind of vigorous labor. You stop doing what you're doing. Hard labor, exertion, these things cease. Rest also means freedom from whatever worries or disturbs you. Some people cannot rest mentally or emotionally because they are so easily upset. They lose sleep at night or have a burdened conscience because they are troubled. Every little nuisance upsets them and they always feel hassled and and bothered. And so they never experience rest in their hearts. Now, rest does not mean freedom from all nuisances and hassles in this life. It means freedom from being so easily bothered by them that it taxes you emotionally, mentally, spiritually. Rest means to be inwardly content, composed, peaceful. To enter God's rest means to be at peace with God, to possess the perfect peace that he gives. Rest can mean to lie down, be settled, fixed, secure, There is no more shifting about and frustration from one thing to another. No more running in circles, trying to find satisfaction here on earth. In God's rest, we are forever established in Christ. We are freed from running from philosophy to philosophy, from religion to religion, from lifestyle to lifestyle. We are freed from being tossed about by every doctrinal wind, every idea or fad, every novelty that blows our way. In Christ, we are established, rooted, grounded, unmovable. That is the Christian's rest. Rest involves remaining confident, keeping trust. In other words, to rest in something or someone means to maintain our confidence in it or him. To enter God's rest, therefore, means to enjoy the perfect, unshakable confidence of salvation in our Lord. We have no more reason to fear. We have absolute trust and confidence in God's power and care. No more floating around. We know whom we have believed and we stand in him. Look again at verse one. It says, therefore, let us fear if while a promise remains of entering his rest, any one of you may seem to have fallen short of it. Here we have an admonition for us as Christians to continue to seek the rest that God has prepared for us. Now, the reference of rest here is scattered throughout the entire argument from chapter three, verse seven through 19, even where the land of Canaan, it was the target. It was the goal for the children of Israel while they were in the wilderness. It is full, blessed, sweet, satisfying, peaceful. It is being at rest from the burden of travel, from the stress of being heavy laden, the concern of constant threats and enemies all around them and on all sides. It is the rest pictured and illustrated by the land flowing with milk and honey that Israel never understood and that entire generation never entered because of unbelief. It is what God gives every person in Christ. And just as Israel never entered Canaan, Canaan's rest because of unbelief, so soul after soul after soul, even before the time of Canaan, have missed God's salvation rest because of unbelief. And so he is urging them to persevere so that they might enter the rest. Just as unbelief and disobedience, as we saw last Lord's Day, keep, kept an entire generation out of the promised land, the author of Hebrews is concerned that there are some, even some in this congregation, who are not persevering in such a way as to enter in the rest that God has prepared for his children. He's concerned about that. And we face the same struggle today. And let's be honest. Even here this morning, there are many of you who are not concerned about entering God's rest. You are searching for rest and contentment and satisfaction in all sorts of things, whether it be material wealth or prosperity or future security, whether it be your health, whether it be beauty, whether it be influence, whatever else. You may be trying to find rest and contentment in your families, but you've stopped seeking to find that rest and contentment, which alone God can provide and can only be found by trusting and resting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the author of Hebrews here in verse one says, be careful that none of you come short. 
be careful that none of you come short. Let us be careful that none of us come short. He's concerned about an attitude of complacency. He is concerned of, of those who are just unconcerned that they might just drift away into spiritual damnation. They have no concern about heavenly reward and rest. Now, another thing that's really important that I want to point out, verse two, he explicitly says that the good news was preached to the Old Testament saints. Look at verse two. It says, for indeed, we have good news preached to us just as they also but the word they heard did not profit them because it was not united by faith in those who heard. So if you want to miss out on faith, it's just like this. Here he says that the good news was preached to the Old Testament saints. You see, you cannot miss that the gospel was preached in the promises in the Old Testament so that all believers in all ages are saved in the same way. They are saved by the gospel. And this is the key. The gospel is not something that was created by the apostles in the New Testament. Yes, it was fleshed out. It was clarified. It was explained. But its basic requirements have always been in every dispensation the same or by grace through faith in Christ. The Old Testament saints were saved by believing in the gospel as it was set forth in the promises. New covenant believers, saints like ourselves, are saved by believing in the gospel as it is set forth in the fulfillment of those promises, Jesus Christ. But it's all the same gospel. There are not two ways of salvation. There's one way of salvation. And that's been the same in all ages. And here it is in bold relief, chapter four, verse two, he says, for we have had the good news preached to us just like it was preached to them. Let me set this right for you. The old covenant believers were saved the exact same way new covenant believers are by faith. And that's what this text is saying. We are justified by faith, just like they were justified in the Old Testament by faith. The act of grace by which God pardons all the believers sins and accepts the believer as righteous because of the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is credited to the believer's account. This wonderful act is known as justification by faith. Believers do not become righteous through faith. They are declared righteous by God. This wasn't just something created in the Reformation, but it is true from the Old Testament all the way through the New. When you turn to the book of Romans, Paul gives example after example, teaching on justification by faith alone. In fact, in chapter four, verse one to four, he gives Abraham as the key reference to understanding justification by faith alone. And in that text, he gives examples from Genesis 15 and 17. And then again, further on in chapter four, verses six to eight, he quotes texts from David in the Old Testament. And then he goes back to Abraham again from verse nine to 25. I mean, the only proof which Paul found sufficient to teach that salvation was by faith alone was from the Old Testament. The wilderness wanders, wanderers, those who deserted Christ, they had the gospel. They had good news the seed form of the gospel that we call the Proto-Evangelion from Genesis 3.15. It continues throughout the entire Old Testament. So the author quickly points out that even though they had heard the gospel and the promises of God in the Old Testament, yet it didn't profit them. Why? Why did it not profit them? Because he says their hearing was not united by faith in those who heard. In other words, they were in unbelief. There was a lack of faith. They failed to continue to trust in God. And that's, of course, one of the central themes of the story of the wandering generation. The people of God who have been brought out of Egypt with mighty miracles did not continue to believe in God. I mean, frankly, it's one of those things that kind of boggles your mind. And we can't believe that people saw with their eyes walls of water around them as they walked through the Red Sea on dry land. We cannot possibly conceive of people seeing that and not being able to trust in God in the wilderness. I mean, it's just, it's startling. How can this happen? But we shouldn't be surprised, should we? It's the deceitfulness of sin. Consider Luke 16, 31. But he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, they will not be persuaded even if someone is raised from the dead. And let's be real honest. He's raised us from the dead spiritually made us one with Christ. And yet we find ourselves wandering, do we not? 
not trusting when we find ourselves in hard spots. We struggle with the same kinds of things. And that's why the author of Hebrews is using this illustration with his congregation. The Lord has done great things in their lives. He's transformed their lives. He's drawn them to Christ. And yet he sees them wandering. And he reminds them that by unbelief and lack of faith and through disobedience, they never entered rest. The good news came to them. God had redeemed them out of Egypt. He had made promises to them. He promised his providence over them. And yet his promises, his good news, his redemption did not benefit them. That ought to move your heart. That people would have seen the mighty redeeming acts of God, heard the voice of God. Remember, he spoke to them the Ten Commandments himself. He made promises to them. He gave commands to them and they did not listen. They didn't benefit. Why? They didn't believe. That was their fundamental failure. Their fundamental disobedience was that they did not believe and it still happens today. And I might add this, the greatest concern of every professing Christian in this room should be falling short of eternal rest. I'll say it again. The chief concern of every confessing Christian should be falling short of eternal rest. Let us be fearful. Lest any of you be found short of falling into the rest. So who enters rest? Revelation 2, 7 says, To he who overcomes, I will grant to eat from the tree of life, and the second death will have no threat to him. So who gets eternal life? Who gets to enter into the rest? Those who overcome. Who escapes eternal judgment? Those who overcome. That's what verse 6 and 14 of chapter 3 says as well. Those who overcome, who continue in their faithfulness to Jesus Christ. And if you consider the opposite, who leads the list of those who inherit the lake of fire at the end of the age? Who faces the second death? Revelation 21, 8 gives a list of them. But what leads the list is this, the cowardly, the unbelieving. I mean, think about that. I mean, the list goes on from there, but the lead the list is the cowardly. Those who did not overcome, those who fell short. I often tell guys who are struggling to boldly stand for the truth that it's more fearful to fall into the hands of the living God. Boldness comes easy when compared to the alternative. We who believe enter the rest. It is the ultimate salvation rest of God. It is not enough to hear the good news. Many people who have heard the gospel on that great day will be ushered into eternal judgment. It's not just about hearing it. The promise that stands is that he who believes in the son has eternal life and the opposite promise stands just as true. He who does not believe in the son will be damned. The ultimate rest, the reward, it's to believers. Romans 10, nine says this, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. John 3, 36 says, he who believes in the son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the son will not see life for the wrath of God abides on him. Heaven is for those who have set their affections and hope on the work of Christ alone. Again, it's not enough just to hear the gospel or to know all the facts about the gospel, which you get from this pulpit every week, but to have all the facts, it is not enough. It will be falling short on the last day if you have not believed. All the facts don't save you. You must believe them. Don't fall short. Principle number two, we see that rest belongs to God. Rest belongs to God. Let me read that again for you. Verses three to six. It says, for we who have believed enter that rest, just as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has said somewhere concerning the seventh day and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they shall not enter my rest. Therefore, since it remains for some to enter it and those who formerly had good news preached to them failed to enter because of disobedience. The rest promised to those who believe is called my rest. That's it. It's God's rest. This is a reference to God's own rest from his work of creation and the rest that he gives us in Christ. 
This is not the rest brought on by weariness or the rest of inactivity, but is the rest of finished work. God has finished his work. God has done it all. And for anyone who wants to enter into this finished work and share in his rest, it's available by faith. When God had finished his work in creation, that's Genesis 2, 1 to 3, it says this, thus the heavens and the earth were completed and all their hosts. By the seventh day, God completed his work, which he had done. And he rested on the seventh day from all of his work, which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and he sanctified it because in it, he rested from all his works, which God had made and created. Sabbath rest. Sabbath rest was instituted as a symbol of the true rest to come in Christ. And that is why the Sabbath could be violated by Jesus and completely set aside in the New Testament. When the rest came, the symbol was useless. Our hope isn't just rest here in the earthly life. Consider Colossians 2, 16 to 17. It says, therefore, let no one act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Things which are a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. The believer's rest is the experience of God's own rest. We who believe enter that rest. Friends, whatever can be said about that rest, we must be sure that it is God's rest. God has a kind of rest, which we see from the supporting passages that the author cites, which is Genesis 2, 2. On the seventh day, God rested. Those who do not enter rest do not enter God's rest. Long before Canaan was on the horizon, there were Old Testament saints who believed and entered into God's rest. This is an eternal rest. It's not just about real estate. This is about the rest and the presence of God. And we look at the creation account, what do you see is the common theme? There's a phrase repeated over and over again. There was evening and there was morning the first day. There was evening and there was morning the second day. There was evening, there was morning the third day and on and on and on again. Six days, God works. But then you come to the seventh day and there is no demarcation. God rested from all his work. There are no boundaries to that day. Do you see that? There's no mention of morning or evening. And why is that? There are no lines to mark off this day. There are no boundaries to God's rest. It is an unending epic of rest. And it's not because God was tired from his labor. It's not as if God just decided to not do anything anymore. That's not what rest entails. It's not, again, inactivity or idleness. Jesus said in John 5, 17, my father is always working. So what is the rest? What it means is this. At the conclusion of God's magnificent creation, there was no more to add. It was perfect. It was complete, harmonious. All was exactly how he wanted it to be. Everything functioned within it perfectly. And only one word is used to communicate all of this to us. Only one word in all the Bible captures God's satisfaction. Only one word that he condescends to bring to us, to tell us about it. And it is this rest, perfect contentment, peace, satisfaction as a consequence of knowing that everything was good, his work was done. When God entered into that rest in Genesis, he always had as his intention from before the foundation of the world, our text says that his people would enter into that rest with him. And that is the destiny of those who believe in his son. And this goes all the way back to creation. Adam and Eve were created upright in the garden. They were at rest in a sense. They relied on God for everything. They had no anxieties, no worries, no pain, no frustrations, no heartaches. They did not need God's forgiveness because they had never sinned. They did not need his consolation because they never grieved. They did not need his encouragement because they never failed. They only needed his fellowship because they were made for him. This was their rest in God. God completed his perfect work and rested. They were his perfect work and they rested in him. But we know what happens next, don't we? Something terrible happened. They fell from a state of innocence. They fell from a state of rest. Adam gave into the deceitfulness of sin. He trusted everything but God at that moment. He trusted himself. He trusted his wife. He trusted the serpent. And when he fell, he forfeited rest. He was cursed. And the work of his hands was cursed. He was to labor and toil. No more rest. And from that time until now, man apart from God, not only has been sinful, but restless. The entire 
purpose of the Bible, the entire work of redemption is God working in human history to bring back man into his rest. And that's what Christ accomplishes. Not just in his death on the cross, though through that he provides forgiveness of sins, which we need to be in the presence of God, but that's only part of it. Through his perfect law obedience, his labor under the law, Jesus was rewarded with rest. And that rest is what is promised to those who receive the righteous merit of Jesus through faith. You see, it's better than Adam's earthly rest because it cannot be lost. And it cannot be lost because it was secured by the immutable work of Christ himself. And it stands true of anyone here today who does not embrace Christ, you will never rest. Those who sinned while wandering in the wilderness not only forfeited Canaan, they forfeited eternal rest. Unless they exercised personal faith in God somewhere during the 40 years of wandering, they would forfeit eternal life of which Canaan was only a symbol, but rest still remains. Why? Because God is not fickle concerning his plans. He doesn't start something without finishing them. He is contrasted here with those who fall short. Those who don't complete the journey, God completes it. He completes his work. God does not establish rest for mankind for nothing. The rest that he has provided, someone will enter. That's what it says. It remains for someone to enter. We call this the pactum salutis in theology. This was a pre-temporal inter-Trinitarian agreement between the father and son, in which the father promises to redeem and elect people, to get them into rest. In his active and passive obedience, Christ fulfills the conditions of the pactum salutis, ratifying the father's promise. And as a result, the father rewards the son's obedience with the salvation of his elect and rest. You see, the son purchased for his people rest. And the father will give his people rest on account of the son. The work is done. And this is why it is so heinous to trust yourself and in your self-righteousness to try to enter rest by your own merits. In God's eternal plan, he created man for fellowship with himself and his plan would not be thwarted. By divine decree, therefore, he has always had a remnant of believers, even amongst the mostly disbelieving Israelites. During the time of Elijah, he thought no one else believed. It was just him alone. Romans 11, 5 says, In the same way, then, there are also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. The way of God's rest has always been narrow, and only a few, relative to all mankind, have ever entered it. But someone must enter it, because God's promise must be fulfilled. And so by sovereign decree, he designed a rest for mankind, and some, therefore, are going to enter it. And you, friends, you must examine yourselves to be certain that you are not self-deceived by unbelief, but that you truly have trusted Christ for that rest. Our third principle, verses 7 to 10, God's promise is still valid today. The promise is still valid today. Let me read this for you. He again fixes a certain day today, saying through David after so long ago, just as he has said before, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God, for the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. Therefore, the promise of rest still stands. Let us be careful that none of us fall short of it. You notice the failure of Israel to enter the rest was because of unbelief. And that unbelief in no way nullifies God's promise. God's promise to bring his people into his rest has always been true. And it extends even to us here today, his promise still stands. This isn't saying that you and I here today or the audience in the book of Hebrews all need to move to the land of Canaan or that we have citizenship in the land and so we need to move there now and take up residence. No, it's, it's about something infinitely greater, the ultimate rest of salvation. Verses eight through 10 compares the two Joshua's. The Joshua of the Old Testament and the Joshua of the New Testament, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he reminds us that Christians ask for, and they desire after the rest that is to come. I mean, if you look at verse eight, it says, if Joshua had given them rest, he would not have to have spoken of another day after that. So you see, there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, just as God did from his. 
And that's it. In verse eight, he's stressing is that Joshua's rest was not the ultimate rest. He got them into the land, didn't he? But that wasn't it. Even though Joshua brought the children of Egypt or of Israel into the land of Canaan, that was not the ultimate rest, which God had prepared for his people. He says explicitly, there remains a Sabbath rest. Israel had a tendency towards satisfaction in earthly things, being content once they were in the land. They were satisfied with the land and they took, they took it in some cases as the ultimate expression of God's rest. And that's why the author of Hebrews quotes Psalm 95 repeatedly in our text. And he says, the word is today. It is an indication that there was more to come, that even regenerate Israelites understood that there was more to come, that the land of Canaan was, but was not the ultimate fulfillment of God's rest for even Israel. It was part of it, but the ultimate fulfillment is salvation. In the scriptures, in fact, there are many pictures of the rest which God has created for his people, right? In creation, the garden is the picture of that rest. The Old Testament, the, the war of redemption in Canaan is a picture of that rest. In the new covenant, the resurrection and ascension of Jesus points forward to the establishment of that rest. And in the consummation in the book of Revelation, the heavenly Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth shows us the ultimate fulfillment of that rest. And that's what Hebrews eleven ten talks about. For he was looking for a city which has foundations and whose architect and builder was God. Not just an earthly country, but a heavenly kingdom. And so the author says, there is something, there is remaining a Sabbath rest for the people of God. And again, he is saying is that our very celebration of even this Lord's day reminds us that there is an ultimate rest that we have not yet entered into. He's asking us to focus on the rest. Are you still desirous of entering into that rest? Do your priorities show that your ultimate goal, goal is earthly rest or heavenly rest? You see, Christ's rest is the final spiritual rest. And that should be your motivation to persevere because you want to enter into that rest. That is the land that we want to experience, is it not? is a rest that is yet to come. It is a heavenly rest that is given by God to those who trust in him. He's asking you not to put all your hopes in this life. He's asking you not to put your faith in this world. He's asking you not to put your faith in God and put your hope on something more, or put your hope on something in this world, but to put your faith in God on something more than what's in this world. Not because he doesn't want you to care about this world, not because he doesn't want you to appreciate the millions of blessings that God pours out on you in this world. Not because he wants you to deny that we have a little, ba little bit of a taste, a foretaste of even the ultimate rest through the blessings that we receive now. But he doesn't want you to do what Israel did and be satisfied with the world here today. And it's only, of course, that he says in verse 9, for the people of God. There remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. It's only for those united to Christ. It's not for those who trust or who it's, it's only for those who trust in Christ. It's not for those who trust in themselves or this world. I mean, what's the application of all this? What are, what are we getting at? Well, it's this press towards the rest. Don't be satisfied with something short of the rest. Don't give up on the rest. That's our goal. And that's where we're headed. Don't fall short today. It's been said that the only ultimate tragedy is that man makes this earth his home. The only ultimate tragedy is that man makes this earth his home. Be sure that is not you here this morning. Since it is true that there are those who will enter that divine rest, according to God's predetermined plan, that we would enter the rest, the promise extends from Egypt to hundreds of years later in the time of David. Do not harden your hearts, as our author says. The promise still stands. Do not harden your hearts. Do not neglect to respond today. Do not forsake him. Come near today. Come. The offer to enter God's rest still stands. If God is still warning to not harden your hearts, then the invitation is still there today. Come today. Now is the time. You see, the people entered the land under Joshua. Yet God's invitation to join the rest was not limited to that. It was not limited to the land there. It extends to you here this very morning. That was a shadow, not the substance. Joshua could never give rest. That's what our text explicitly says. 
Jesus is better than Joshua because he brings rest. He brings rest. If you are weary from trying to work your way into rest, into heaven, God extends this invitation. Come. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And when by the grace of God, anyone comes to Jesus Christ, they rest from every attempt of self-righteousness to work their way to heaven and to earn their own rest, to be comfortable in this world. In the sense of salvation, we cease the work. But in the sense of gospel ministry, the work is just beginning. This side of heaven, God has work for us to do. We have not entered into that final rest yet. So that must make you look at yourselves. Are you serving him? Advancing his cause. That work can be tiresome, taxing, difficult, costly. It will demand incredible sacrifices. It will arouse hostility and antagonism from your friends and family. But there is still the final fruit of eternal rest to come. We have peace in our souls, but the best is yet to come. Sabbath rest, God's kind of rest. When all the toil, work, labor, pain, and sacrifice will be brought to an end. Revelation 14, 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying, Write, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, so they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow with them. So they may rest from their labors. Principle four, ultimate rest merits our most rigorous consideration. Verse 11, Let us make every effort to enter that rest. Consider all that we've seen up to this point. What's he saying is this. Here, here it comes in verse 11. It's very clear. He says, let us therefore strive to enter that rest so that no one may fall by the same sort of disobedience. In other words, he's saying, Christian, set your heart on entering rest. Seek your ultimate peace and joy and favor and satisfaction and fulfillment, not here, but in God and in the rest that only he can give. The ultimate rest of eternal life. I mean, do you remember what Paul will say, right? If we have believed what we believe for this life only, then we are of, above all men most miserable to be pitied in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, the Christian faith is not worth it unless there is a resurrection that awaits us and a rest that we will enter. You know, some people might say that even if there is no afterlife, you know, the Christian life is a noble and, and a moral life, a good way to live. But Paul says, if I don't believe in the resurrection, if I don't believe in a rest that is to come, I would eat and drink because tomorrow I die and it's done. It's because of the resurrection. It's because of the rest that is to come that we are enabled to live this life as believers. And so he says, set your hearts on the things or the rest that is to come. And what does he do here at the end? He hangs the wilderness generation in front of the public eye of those who had failed those who entered near the rest, those who scandalously came close to the rest, who were very, very near, but they never finished the race. They never entered the rest. Their failure should spark your motivation to not be like them. Let us make every effort to enter the rest. Let us make every effort to not end up like Israel. He's not telling us that we can earn salvation, but we must make every effort to make sure that we are not deluding ourselves, but to make sure that we are indeed resting in faith in Christ. Here is an extension to put your faith under the microscope, to put it through the rigorous scrutiny of self-examination to see if it is the real deal. More than acknowledgement, more than mere assent, but throwing yourselves upon the mercy seat and righteous merit of Jesus Christ. Is that what you possess this morning? If not, then you are shying away from the rest. Now, one thing I want to point out to you in your English text doesn't convey this. You'll see in verse eight. I just want to kind of circle back around to that. You, you look back at it in the Greek, Joshua and Jesus are spelt the exact same way. You may see that in a footnote if you have a New American Standard Bible. But now we see in verse eight, it refers to Joshua, of course. But I want to point out to you something that the first generation of believers would have likely read that. And it would have been like a nail being driven through their heart. They would have seen Jesus falling short of him. They would have seen that in their past, there was a Joshua who led them into the land. 
but he never let them into rest. But they know that there is a second Joshua who they are in danger of shying away from, who doesn't lead men into land, but he leads them into rest. Therefore make every effort to enter into the rest. There is no other way, but through the greater Joshua. He is concerned to bring his own people into his own work of rest. Don't just follow him part way, follow him into the content, you know, the contentment and satisfaction that comes from finishing with him, knowing that everything is very good with Jesus. Martin Luther once said, speaking about the way we all you know, want peace in this life rather than, the, rather than the righteousness of God in this life, and thus you never actually find peace. He says this, it is due to the perversity of men that they seek first peace and then righteousness. And consequently, they find no peace. What Luther was saying is that you'll pursue the righteousness of God, just like Jesus said, if you do that, you will find peace. First, the kingdom and its righteousness, and then all these things will be added unto you. Luther said that if you'll pursue the righteousness of God, you'll find the rest of God. You'll find the peace of God. You'll find the peace which, pa which passes all understanding. But if you seek something else, you're going to miss it. And I can tell you that this morning, that if you find peace in anything other than Christ, you will miss the rest. For those of you who are struggling to see if you are at rest with God, or if you are fearful of not entering that rest, it's because you are finding rest in something else this morning, in all the wrong places. You see, the problem is not that you want too much, is that you're satisfied with too little. You are satisfied with the token rest and the satisfaction of the temporal contentment in this world, which always has diminishing returns and always disappoints instead of pressing towards the ultimate rest, which God has prepared for you in Christ. The author of Hebrews wants his congregation to stop and reflect for a minute and say, are we pressing towards the rest? And then he urges you, press towards the rest. Don't fall short of that rest. And that's an essential thing for you to consider this very morning. Have you entered that rest? If you have not entered rest through Jesus Christ in your heart, you should have no hope of entering the rest in eternity. What, because, what could be said of those of you here today who are not pilgrims, you have made this earthly place your home. And I'm sure your creaturely comforts offer you some sort of repose, some kind of rest. Perhaps you love this world like Demas, but I have heavy words for you this morning. This world where you have found rest, this earthly city and all of its works, all the rest that you found up in it will be burned. The city of which you have become a citizen will be destroyed. If you have not been converted to Christ, the city which you now rest in is a city of destruction and it will come to an end. The king will send his armies against this guilty city and he will destroy it. And if you are citizens of it, you will lose all that you have. You will lose all of your comfort, all of your security, all of your rest. You will lose your soul. And we ask, well, where shall I go? How can I escape this coming judgment? Where can I find comfort, security, and rest? Well, I'll tell you. You must do what Lot did when the angels came to him in Genesis 19, 17. They said, escape for your life. Do not look behind you. Do not stay anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountain so you are not swept away. You might ask to what mountain? Where shall I go? Where shall I flee? The mountain of safety, Calvary, where Jesus died. There you will live and there you will find rest. There is death everywhere else but there. But there is life arising from his death. So flee to him, trust him now, and you are saved. You will become a stranger and a pilgrim in this world. Yes, but a citizen of heaven. I promise that in the better land, you will find rest, which you can never find here. It is a rest, which you cannot find in this land, which is polluted, cursed from the fall. But friends, let us long for, strive for a greater rest in a heavenly country that was never cursed and to a city that is blessed forevermore. There Jesus dwells. There may we find our home. There may we find our security. There may we find our comfort. Friends, there may we find our rest. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you today and we thank you for the rest that you've given us in Christ. 
that his work is complete, that we add nothing to it. Lord, may we be content in our souls for the heavenly reward that is to come because of what Christ has accomplished for us. Lord, may this give us strength to be about the battle here on earth, to be about the race to finish well. Lord, give us strength to be content in what is to come, not what is in front of us. Lord, help us to run the race of faith so none come short. Lord, may you grow us into the image of Christ, conform us more and more into the image of Christ so that we might be satisfied in him and him alone. In the name of Jesus Christ, our high priest, we pray. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from our guest speaker. For more information about the ministry of the Grace Life Pulpit, visit at www.thegracelifepulpit.com. Please note law prohibits the unauthorized copying or distributing of this audio file. Requests for permission to copy or distribute are made in writing to the Grace Life Pulpit. Copyright by the Grace Life Pulpit, all rights reserved.